Good evening and welcome. My name is Hélène Menager, I'm a consultant dermatologist and trustee of the RSM. And I am delighted to be hosting the third of our climate change series. Uh, thanks to Michael Rapp for his generous support in allowing free, free access to this webinar series. I'd like to thank Professor, Professor Linda Luxon for asking me to chair this session. I'd also like to thank my colleagues, Dr. Claire Fuller, Dr. Rachel Abbott, Tabby Leslie, and Anna Stillwell for their assistance. We have some splendid speakers this evening, which is going to take the form of a dermatology RSM sessions with five short presentations. The only difference will be that our questions and discussion will be at the end. So please send your questions in on the Q&A as we go along. And we particularly welcome, well, welcome questions from all of you, but medical students, young doctors, don't be shy because you are the stakeholders in this. Thank you very much. So our first speaker tonight is Professor Anthony Young. I've known Anthony for over 30 years since I first entered dermatology through photodermatology. His degree of expertise in photobiology and photoimmunology is very special indeed. Anthony is Emeritus Professor of Photodermatology at King's College London, and amongst other responsibilities, he is a member of the Environmental Assessments Panel of the UN. Anthony is going to talk about climate change, ultraviolet radiation, which of course impacts upon skin cancer. Thank you, Anthony. Thank you, Elaine, and thank you also the RSM for this invitation. So, I will talk about climate change and human skin cancer in the context of ultraviolet radiation. Next slide, please. So here we see a summary of the different types of ultraviolet radiation, UVC, which we don't have at the Earth's surface because it's totally absorbed by the ozone layer. UVB that we have at the Earth's surface, about 5% of terrestrial sunlight, and that's strongly attenuated by the ozone layer. And we have mostly UVA, and that's minimally affected by the ozone layer, and that's demonstrated on the cartoon on the right. In terms of the effects of sunlight on skin, these are mostly caused by UVB. Sunburn we're familiar with, but very important, especially in the context of skin cancer, is DNA damage and mutation. UV is the main source of most skin cancers, and these are keratinocyte cancers and melanoma. But I also want to mention the benefits of UVB, specifically vitamin D synthesis. Next slide, please. So this, this slide shows examples of UV-induced DNA damage in a holiday situation. On the left, you have a section of human epidermis that's exposed to a low dose of UVB, and you can see the red nuclei, which is indicative of a particular type of DNA damage that's important in skin cancer. The two panels on the right show um, a UV dosimeter that measures UVB that was worn by volunteers on a holiday study that we published a few years back. And what this shows is log UVB dose um, on the horizontal axis and DNA damage on the vertical axis. And you can see a very nice linear relationship. Most of these volunteers were on holiday in Tenerife for a week in March, which is not especially sunny. What's interesting in this study is that the Danes had 43% of their annual UVB exposure in one week. And that just stresses the importance of human behavior in terms of UV exposure. Next slide. So I just want to talk about some recent changes in uh, skin cancer over the last few decades. And we're talking about melanoma and keratinocyte cancers, which are basal cell carcinoma and squamous cell carcinoma. And here are some examples in Iceland, which is not a sunny country. Over the period 1981 to 2017, BCC increased between 2.3 and 3.7 fold in men and women respectively. In the Netherlands, over a period 1989 to 2017, squamous cell carcinoma in situ showed a six fold and a 7.7 fold increase in men and women respectively. China, over a period of 1990 to 2017, 
showed an increased average annual percent change in melanoma of 6.1%. In the USA, between 2001 and 2015, this increase was 1.8% in all ethnicities over 40 years. You can find data like this from all over the world, and in most countries, skin cancer incidence is increasing. Next slide, please. So what may be very important in this is the Montreal Protocol and various amendments. In the 1970s, it was discovered that synthetic uh, chemicals uh, deplete stratospheric ozone. Uh, these are include, for example, chlorofluorocarbons, and these are known as ozone-depleting substances. The world's governments got together in 1985 to adopt the Vienna Convention for the Protection of the Ozone Layer in response to the prospect of increasing ozone depletion. In 1987, the Montreal Protocol was established as an international treaty designed to control the production and consumption of CFCs and other ozone depleting substances, and also the replacement of CFCs with hydrofluorocarbons that are less damaging to the ozone layer, but still cause some damage, and hydrofluorocarbons that don't damage the ozone layer. And the most recent amendment was the Kigali Amendment, which planned to phase down the HFCs because they are greenhouse gases. And that obviously is important in terms of global warming. warming. Next slide, please. So here we see some examples of the trends um, with time. On the left panel, you see year from 1950 to 2100, and the graphs show various uh, ozone depleting substances. Most of these are also greenhouse gases too. And you can see the upward trend peaking in the late 1900s, and we have a, a downward trend and you're expected to reach in about 2060 to the situation that was the case in 1960. And on the right, you see um, a, a satellite image of the ozone hole over Antarctica. This was taken in September 2019, and this was the smallest hole ever. But that wasn't due particularly to deplete to reduction of ozone depleting substances, more due to the um, bizarre weather patterns that take place over the, the, the South Pole. Next slide, please. So what are the projected effects of the Montreal Protocol on skin cancer? Well, the US Environmental Protection Agency used a model, the Atmospheric Health Effects Framework model, and it assumed that some protection behavior would remain constant. And this estimated that it would prevent 432 million cases of keratinocyte cancer and 11 million cases of melanoma in the US for people born between 1890 and 2100. Also, it would prevent 21.3 million deaths, mainly from melanoma, but not exclusively. And the greatest effect would be on people born between 1980 and, sorry, 1960 and 1980 because they experience the peaks of ozone uh, layer depletion. And in fact, those born from uh, 2040 onwards probably will have no effect because the ozone layer will have recovered. Now, there are some mouse data from some time back and also some modeling that suggests that skin cancer, keratinocyte cancer, uh, may increase with increased heat. So this suggests that um, these gases, which are also uh, greenhouse gases, may also, uh, the reduction may also benefit uh, skin cancer in terms of reduction due to a lowering of temperature. But I think these data are extremely speculative. Next slide, please. So in conclusion, I think the Montreal, the Montreal Protocol is an excellent example of long-term international cooperation in addressing a global problem. I think it's a model for future solutions. The preventative action has and will reduce the production of ozone depleting substances, many of which, in fact, most of them are also greenhouse gases, so you're killing two birds with one stone here. And the modeling suggests that the Montreal Protocol has and will have a major beneficial effect on skin health, in particular, um, skin cancer, and also this will reduce economic burdens with skin cancer, which is actually a rather expensive condition to treat. Uh, Helene, in, in the introduction, mentioned the UN um, Environmental Effects Assessment Panel, and I sit on this, and we review these data annually and publish um, our updates on all aspects of ozone layer depletion and recovery. 
the web link is there and it's also listed in my reading list. Um, it's a very good source of information. So I thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Anthony. I hope you can hear me all right. I can, yes. Brilliant, thank you very much. That was lovely, thank you very much. It's also hugely encouraging because it shows that um, taking action together can um, uh, produce change. So thank you very much for that. What is less clear is whether temperature increases will lead to a change in human behavior and increase um, skin cancer through outdoor exposure. And um, are sun creams the answer to this? Well, probably not. And this leads me to our next speaker, Professor um, Eleni Linos. Eleni is Professor of Dermatology and Epidemiology at Stanford. She trained at Cambridge and Oxford and is deputy editor of the British Journal of Dermatology. Eleni lives in California and she's also going to tell us at first hand about her experience of practicing dermatology in the wildfires. Eleni, sunscreens cancer and protecting our planet. Thank you. Good evening to those of you in the UK and good morning from California. Today I'm gonna to speak to you about sunscreens, cancer, and protecting our planet. And I speak to you not only as a dermatologist and scientist studying issues of skin cancer prevention for over a decade, but also as a person living in California. The last few years, the devastating forest fires are truly terrifying and bring issues of climate change and the importance of speaking up on issues regarding the protection of our environment right to the forefront of our minds. So sunscreen is a topic that is very common and familiar to many, us, many of us dermatologists. And the reason for this is that the use of sunscreen has increased in direct response to the increase in skin cancer. There are over 5 million new skin cancer cases each year in the US alone. And sunscreen recommendations have grown in order to protect patients from these risks. Now the sunscreen market is worth over 13 billion US dollars globally. And the problem arises when concerns about chemicals in sunscreens, specifically oxybenzone, which is present in about 70% of sunscreens started arising. In one experiment under laboratory conditions, oxybenzone was found to be toxic to corals and led to coral bleaching. That's a process by which corals that are stressed by changes in their environment expel the algae living in their tissues and turn white. Now this has many downstream effects for the marine life these corals support. In another experiment in Japanese medaka fish, high oxybenzone levels led to decreased egg pr production, fewer egg hatchlings, and possible feminization of male fish. Now we know that coral reef ecosystems are threatened by many other factors, climate change, ocean acidification, coastal pollution. So sunscreens are by no means the only causes of these problems, and the science is not definitive. The science currently is suggestive. However, these suggestions are concerning. There's concerns about chemicals in sunscreen being toxic to corals, leading to coral bleaching, affecting photosynthesis of green algae, decreasing fertility in fish, affecting the immune and reproductive um, uh, uh, functions of sea urchins, and even accumulation in dolphins. And putting aside the contents of these sunscreen bottles, we have to think of the packaging as well. The sunscreen plastic bottles, as well as the packaging they're shipped in, are a major concern in addition. So based on this evidence, this year in 2021, Hawaii became the first US state to ban the sale or distribution of any sunscreens containing these chemicals. And there was some concern among some in the dermatology community because ultimately we still have this major problem of skin cancer. So each year in the US, more than 5.4 million skin cancers, including basal and squamous cell cancers, over 100,000 new melanomas, 
and over 7,000 deaths from melanoma. So how do you reconcile this? How do you address this dilemma of protecting our planet while also protecting the health of individual patients? Well, the good news is that we have a solution that can address both. And that is alternative forms of sun protection, staying in the shade, wearing broad brimmed hats, mm. long sleeved shirts, avoiding the midday sun are all solutions that can both prevent skin cancer as well as protect the planet. We should not underestimate the value of these because in addition to being very effective forms of sun protection, they're also cheaper long-term because you don't need to keep buying them. They don't come in plastic bottles, so you have the additional potential benefit uh, to the environment there. And they're actually extremely effective. For areas you cannot cover, the recommendation I would give my patients is to use zinc and titanium mineral sunscreens, especially the non-nano kind, um, which you know are pasty and white, but are again, incredibly effective. But I think reorganizing our medical advice to de-emphasize sunscreen as the first form of sun protection and instead focus on physical measures can make a big difference. And that brings me to what I, the point I wanna close with. I believe that doctors can be advocates for environmental protections. We often think of ourselves as specialists that can only give advice on a narrow uh, amount of information we have been trained in. However, our voices as trusted members of our communities are extremely powerful. And I think we have a duty to use those voices to advocate for causes we believe in. In addition, our medical advice has implications for the environment. Whether we recommend hats and long sleeves first instead of sunscreen as the first mode of sun protection can make a difference to the marine environment, potentially. Whether we recommend less red meat as a cardiologist or as a GP can have effects for that patient's health as well as for the environment as a whole recommending cycling or walking to work instead of using cars has downstream effects for that patient's health and for the environment. So combining our medical advice to have these dual benefits is something I believe we should all think about. And finally, there are changes we can make in our daily lives, in our workplace processes. As the deputy editor of the British Journal of Dermatology, I'm really proud that we made a simple change to change the packaging the journal is delivered in so that it's biodegradable and sustainable. But also once we start to travel, the choices for air travel and frequency of air travel is again, a small step that can make a big difference. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much, um, Eleni, and thank you for joining us from so far, so far away. Um, I met our next speaker online. Misha, we should stop meeting like this. Misha Rosenbach is Professor of Dermatology at the University of Pennsylvania and co-chair of the American Academy of Dermatology Export, uh, Expert Resource Group for Climate Change and Environmental Effects. He will speak on the effect of climate change on infectious disease of the skin. Thank you, Misha. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. It's an incredible honor to be here and learn a lot from all the other speakers. Um, so um, I have no conflicts to disclose and I'm going to start with what got me interested in this topic. So I've always cared about the earth and climate and the future, um, but it was hard to tie it into my practice as a dermatologist and a physician. But I run the inpatient consult service at the University of Pennsylvania and we saw this adult patient with these oval vesicles on their hands we diagnosed this patient with adult hand, foot, and mouth disease. Now, this is a Coxsackie virus infection that typically affects children. But it turns out that in China, this is a reportable disease. And there was modeling that suggested that there would be increased rates and atypical presentations of Coxsackie virus over time as the earth warmed and there was more humidity in the air. And this has been shown um, in, in literature beyond China at this point. So I had the privilege of being the guest editor of a special issue of the International Journal of Women's Dermatology. And there's a very nice review article covering a lot of um, the effects of climate change on infectious diseases. And there's this very nice table here that talks about 
different ways that climate sensitivity can impact specific diseases, ranging from microbes that are sensitive to climate variables, such as temperature and humidity, increased survival or expanded geographic range of specific vectors or the animal's reservoirs, which can transmit um, different infections to humans, an increased incidence during or after extreme weather events, and impacts of human migration, overcrowding, and poverty uh, forced on uh, different populations by climate change related extreme weather events. And I'm going to touch on a few examples of these different types of infections that you can see in the skin. So I practice in Pennsylvania, which is one of the Lyme capitals of the world on in the northeast of the US. And so this is the Ixodes tick. And this is a map that basically shows the range of this tick as climate is warming and the um, range of the Ixodes tick and, and deer that it can live on um, extending farther northward. And now we are seeing colleagues in Maine and Canada have never been trained or expected to see Lyme in their practices, seeing um, the uh, classic erythema chronica migram rash in unusual places, but not just unusual geography, also unusual seasons. So normally we think of this as something that will happen in April, May, June, but we start seeing this now in February and March with mild winters and extension of the warm period earlier and later in the year. And you can see the CDC has measured an increase in tick-borne illnesses. And you can see the map from the CDC showing where there are cases of Lyme disease and it is spread out farther north and farther west over time with the changing climate. But what we're seeing is not just limited to Ixodes tick, we also see um, the, the, um, the vector-borne illnesses that are typically tropical illnesses now extending farther and farther from the poles into formerly subtropical regions. So this is dengue, characterized by the islands of sparing, so these little white islands in a sea of red. This is late stage chikungunya. Early chikungunya is a morbilliform rash with erythematous macules and papules, often with some joint involvement. But late stage, it can leave, leave these kind of rediform hyperpigmented lesions. This is a picture of Zika, which uh, among many other manifestations can be characterized by some scleral injection and uh, conjunctival erythema. And so if you look at the pattern of the tick, um, the Aedes mosquito that carries these, you can see that it, it, its range and habitat is expanding over time from the poles outwards. And this picture on the right is basically a heat map that shows red areas as new territory um, for this mosquito where we are expecting to see dengue um, from in 2020 and 2050 and in 2080. However, it's not just vector-borne illnesses that are changing where they present. It's also some other um, patterns of infection. And so coccidioidomycosis, is something that physicians, especially dermatologists, learn for their board exams as, as valley fever that occurs in the southwest US around um, Arizona and, and Southern California. However, you can see an expanded rate over time of coccidioidomycosis infection with some peaks in different areas. And these peaks in the green bar is, Calif is Arizona. This followed a prolonged drought there. And so Arizona, this is uh, in California right now, as Dr. Linos uh, alluded to, we've seen devastating wildfires as a result of prolonged droughts in the western part of the US. And so entering this wildfire season in California, this is a record, uh, this is I think the second or third driest it has ever been. And so we could predict that over the next few years, we will see an uptick in coccidioidomycosis infection as this fungus lives in the dust and dry um, uh, drought conditions lead to spread. And so now instead of just seeing the coccidioidomycosis infections in Southwest US, we're seeing, seeing expansion across the Western coast into the Pacific Northwest where there are now endemic cases of coccidioidomycosis in uh, Washington state. Similarly, the sand fly can transmit leishmaniasis. And so most physicians are used to a board exam question that might say, oh, a person goes to camp on the beach in Costa Rica, and then you stop reading and say, well, the answer is going to be that this is leishmaniasis. Interestingly, there was this paper in 2010 in PAS1 that predicted you would see an expansion of the sand fly habitat over time in response to climate change. And sure enough, we've now seen 10 years later, the first cases of endemic human cutaneous leishmaniasis occurring in the United States. So this is a formerly tropical illness where the vector that transmits this infection now can find its home beyond the equatorial region and can occur in continental US. Moving from infections to extreme weather briefly, we know that as average water temperature increases, the strength and severity of storms and wind speed, speed goes up as the hotter oceans are fueling more severe hurricanes, but also conversely, that may often lead to them moving more slowly over land and dropping more and more torrential rain. And you can see a fairly tight relationship between rising surface temperatures and frequency of extreme weather events. 
And these are tracked by an international disaster database. And you can see a, a, a gradual and then marked uptick in extreme weather uh, events related to uh, um, water, water and uh, attributed to um, some of the changing climate that we're living in. This is a busy slide, but this just highlights this article, which is a review of infectious and non-infectious dermatological consequences after extreme weather events. And the WHO notes that skin disease is the most common issue following severe flooding. Here are just some examples of things ranging from Vibrio to um, fungal infections uh, to, to atypical mycobacterial infections and, and mucor. You can have arthropod bites, contact dermatitis, and traumatic injuries as well. Following tornadoes, you can see debris leading to human lacerations and mucor infections along the path of the eye of extreme weather storms that are fueled by warming air and hotter oceans. But there are unexpected events as well, such as more uh, jellyfish envenomations or things that we can't predict, such as as humans are moving more into natural environments, we're coming into contact with zoonotic diseases, such as COVID. Um, not that that is a climate change induced pandemic, but as we are moving into different habitats, we might see unexpected events, such as reports of um, uh, reindeer carcasses thawing and anthrax infection, or this concerning report in Science, uh, the, the, the very reputable journal showing that there were um, uh, mass graves from smallpox virus in permafrost frost mud that was thawing as the world was warming. And so we know some of the risks that we can measure, but there are also the unknowns that we have to consider that we're forcing the earth to change at a very rapid rate, faster than ever has happened before in human history. And what the health consequences are remain to be determined. There are many resources that physicians can look at, and I thank you all for listening. Thanks, Misha. That was that. That was very interesting. So we're seeing um, conditions that we wouldn't normally be seeing um, in our in our particular areas, and um, that does cause cause for concern. Now, our next speaker is also from the USA, but he is homegrown, and it's my honour to introduce Professor Mark Davis. Mark qualified from Dublin and he's now Chair of the Department of Dermatology at the Mayo Clinic, Rochester, Minnesota. He's the USA Chair of the Climate Change Committee of the International Society of Dermatology. And he will speak on what climate change may mean for inflammatory skin disease. Thank you very much. Well, Professor thank you Davis. very much. Thank you very much for your introduction, Dr. Manage, and thank you to the Royal Society of Medicine for inviting me to speak. And this is a wonderful session. Um, I bring you greetings from the north of the um, United States, uh, where we um, complain a lot about our winters, but it may be something that we might be dreaming of in the future. Because as we know, um, climate change is happening and the earth is getting warmer and warmer um, on the surface, and it's what we're trying to prevent. I wanted to touch on some non-infectious um, concerns regarding the skin that can occur in association with this climate change. And I'm going to just talk about various factors um, that we might need to consider. So first of all, with an increased temperature, I think anybody that has a, an, an itch or a rash will tell you that the itch is much worse um, during, when, when they, when the, during when it's hot. And um, that's a very consistent complaint of patients. And it's one thing to consider. The other thing is that we know that um, it, if the temperature, surface temperature is rising, then um, your body heat may increase. And unless you're able to dissipate that increased body heat by sweating, you're, you could be in trouble. And that can obviously lead to heat stroke and even death. And so sweating is important for survival of our species. Um, but one thing to consider is that some people congenitally can't sweat. It's actually an underdiagnosed entity, I think, um, chronic idiopathic anhydrosis. Um, but also it's been shown that some skin diseases are associated with um, decreased ability to sweat. So that's a factor con to consider um, as the, the earth heats. Of course, as temperatures increase, ice melts, seas rise and seas warm. And um, as we heard in the last talk, um, one thing that can occur among many is that you can get a proliferation of things like jellyfish and off the southeast um, 
um, corner of the United States in the Atlantic Ocean there, it's been demonstrated that not only is there a proliferation of jellyfish um, stings, but also this Portuguese man of war um, has proliferated there. And there's been a lot of animations seen and um, which often present looking like this um, in clinics. So we have to get used to seeing this type of thing and dealing with it. And that's just one factor with the warmer seas. We know, also know on Earth as the, as the temperature rises, certain plants really get a life of their own. And in the United States, um, it's been, uh, we find that things like poison ivy, which can cause horrible allergic contact dermatitis proliferate. Um, and um, that's been well described. And patients present like this with linear blisters where they've come in contact with this weed in, in, in the soil. And that's in places like the United States, but what about drier places? Well, hot places get hotter and crops fail. And um, of course, what does that lead to? Um, unfortunately, malnutrition with its many um, um, different clinical signs. Um, and how, here we, um, so pay, there's so many different clinical syndromes associated with specific nutritional deficiencies, but overall nutri nutritional deficiencies can lead to marasmus and quashiorcor, as we see in these pictures here. Of course, as the land becomes inhospitable and dry, it's inevitable that human beings are going to want to move and uh, migrate. And of course, that's causing big political problems throughout the world. Kids and adults are on the move and they often have nothing to eat um, on the, their way. They get dehydrated, they get trauma and lacerations and sunburns as they migrate. Um, and there's all sorts of problems associated with that to do with the skin. Um, and then when they do arrive in, in places where they are held um, before they can be admitted to some of our, to for example, Europe or the United States, they're often put in refugee camps. And obviously these are places where they can really catch a lot of communicable diseases um, among them being scabies, um, as we see here, the scabies might spread like wildfire. So, you know, as the temperatures rise, um, we've also heard that that leads to extreme weather events. And the heat waves and wildfires of California um, last year and in Australia um, recently um, have all been huge problems um, and all their consequences um, can be very severe, but also the warmer seas lead to precipitation in the air and we get storms and hurricanes and floods um, as we heard in that last talk. Of course, you know, what can happen to your skin when you're in a wildfire? Well, obviously you can get burned. Uh, there's air pollution um, um, secondary to that and that can tip the balance with regard to the prevalence of some skin diseases like atopic dermatitis prevalence can increase, but also the severity of um, things like atopic dermatitis can increase. With the air pollution, we do see those flares of dermatoses, and it has been shown that within very polluted areas, there's been increased hospitalization of, um, of patients with skin diseases like atopic dermatitis, pemphigus, and some of the connective tissue diseases like lupus. In floods and hurricanes, um, obviously huge amount of side effects, and Dr. Rosenbach touched on many of these earlier. Obviously, if you're in the, if you're submerged in water, you can get irritant contact dermatitis. You, your, your skin can be, get lacerated and um, you can get abrasions because you can't really see um, under the water. And then you can develop things like um, ulcers secondary to the maceration of the skin and even the trench foot or the immersion foot can develop. We also know that in, in, in severe um, weather events like this, you know, if you have a skin disease, you know, it's, not, it's going to be very hard to, to pay that meticulous care to care of your skin disease in these types of events. Skin care really involves being very meticulous about applying creams and that sort of thing. And if you're, not, if you're in these circumstances, it's very difficult to do. The stress of all this and the mental health associated with extreme weather events can really be impactful and um, lead to bad care of skin disease, but also directly exacerbate many skin diseases and psoriasis is an example of that. So these rising temperatures associated with climate change can impact our skin in so many ways. And I've just shown you some of the non-infectious um, ways it can impact the skin. Our action points are obviously, we have to find a way to cool it, cool this earth. Thank you, I look forward to our discussion.
Thank you, Mark. That was absolutely splendid and very clear indeed. And I think all of us who practice dermatology know what a profound impact um, stress can have on our patient's skin. And also how um, treating skin disease is not just a matter of popping a pill often, it involves commitment and time and the right environment. Um, so thank you for touching on those matters also. Now we've learned from the COVID-19 pandemic, the dangers of doing too little too late. The NHS is a significant contributor to um, carbon emissions in the United Kingdom. Our next speaker, Dr. Kate Lawler, is a specialist registrar in dermatology at Cardiff. And Kate is going to talk to us about the small steps we can all be beginning to take as we journey towards environmentally sustainable dermatology. Welcome, Kate, and thank you. Many thanks for the introduction and the opportunity to speak here today. So this is a broad topic to cover, so I'm going to focus on three main points. First of all, the use of surgical instruments in dermatology, the, um, how we can apply recycling in our department. And then I'm briefly going to touch on sustainable skincare um, also. So by way of introduction, the NHS has produced this document in October 2020 to model achieving net zero emissions. And an important um, figure taken from this document is shown here. It demonstrates the varying proportions of the entire carbon emissions based on the source. As you can see, medicines and chemicals account for about a fifth of the entire carbon footprint of the NHS. And this is mostly due to the impact of anaesthetic gases and are as such outside the remit of dermatology. But we can also see that medical equipment accounts for about 10%, which is certainly relevant to our specialty. So because of this, we have studied the, um, this important source of carbon footprint within our department. Here on the left, you can see the disposable single-use packs alongside the multi-use packs that we also use. Um, I would like to uh, ask you to answer this poll question. Um, so if the poll question could be brought up, please. Um, which do you think has the greater carbon footprint in terms of the production and disposal? Single-use theatre packs or reusable theatre packs? I think that should be enough time if you'd like to end the poll. Great. Um, yes. So I'll just close that and move on to the answer. So yes, the single use theatre pack does have um, a, a greater carbon footprint. So this work was done by one of the um, Cardiff University um, students um, who looked at the total um, emissions based on the type of theatre pack used. And we can see that the um, reusable pack has about a 20% less carbon footprint compared to the single use pack. So this equates to approximately a 70 minute flight if we're talking in kind of more real world terms. So taking message one is to, um, it's important to identify the changes that will make impacts and to re-emphasize the um, impact that medical instruments can have on the carbon footprint within the NHS. So moving to the next topic, um, and starting with the poll question, I'd like you to answer this. Which of these items do you think is not recyclable? The uh, paper packaging in sterile gloves, empty saline pods, plastic needle caps, or the plastic curette packaging? And again, I think you can end, uh, end the poll, please, in the interest of time. Lovely. So um, yes, so 35% had this one right. Um, so the plastic curette packaging is not recyclable. So this diagram is taken um, from the Cardiff and Vale main theatre. And as you can see here in the green, um, in this part of the world anyway, if you can tap it, it's generally recyclable. But anything that has a glue sealed wrapping um, prevents it from being recyclable. So the emphasis here is that um, uh, education surrounding what items can and cannot be recycled. These um, 
uh, diagrams are put up in all our clinical and theatre rooms to remind and educate staff of what items can and cannot be recycled. So take home message two is um, adapted from the work of one of our foundation doctors, Dr. Ethan Ang, who um, uh, brought a lot of points, including encouraging suppliers to use less unnecessary packaging. Moving on then to um, item four, um, the, in order to be labelled as organic, food has to come from 90%, 95% of sources need to be organically um, sourced. But if you consider skincare industry, I'd like you to consider what percentage of um, the products need to be organic in order to be labelled as such. So less than 1%, 1 to 4%, 5 to 9 or greater than 10%. And if you could end the poll there, there, please. Lovely. OK, so. Um, in fact, the unfortunate reality is that there is no definition of the term organic as relates to skincare products within the UK at present, and also certification of the term is currently not a legal requirement. According to a set of regulations known as the common criteria, we can't put false information on labels, but this essentially means that um, products that contain less than 1% of organic materials can be labeled as organic. And it's similar in the uh, United States uh, where the Food and Drug Administration don't currently um, have a legal definition for the term organic. So it would be difficult not to notice the explosion of plant-based, eco-friendly and natural skincare products that have come on the market in the last 10 years. But unfortunately, the um, terminology is marred with ambiguity. Similar to the term organic, there is no regulation defining the term natural. And it is interesting to note that the Soil Association found that 80% of people said that they would be more likely to buy a product if it was labelled orga as organic. This highlights the enormous marketing potential that these terms offer and coupled with a lack of associated regulations make for worrying trends in the industry. Some could argue that the skincare and cosmetic industry is outside the remit of medical dermatologists, but I would say that unless we as a group of professionals with expertise in skin look to change this narrative, the likelihood is that, is that nobody else will. And I don't know about your own experience, but I have lost count of the number of patients who have um, told me that they like to use natural products. And I find it really beneficial to be able to advise them on what these terms actually mean. Um, in my current role um, working in the patch test clinic, um, I often um, come across patients who develop uh, allergy. And um, one of the natural products that we test for is linalool. So it certainly is natural as it comes from uh, flowers and plant spices. Um, but these UK studies demonstrate that there was almost a 6% um, allergic contact dermatitis detected in this multi-center UK study. This is one of the examples I like to use when explaining to patients that natural and plant-based doesn't equate to skin safe. Of course, we also need to remember that natural does not always mean sustainable. Rare ingredients and energy intensive processes may be a lot less sustainable when compared with um, synthetically created materials. So lab based does not have to equate to damaging. So take home message three is just the importance of um, reading the fine print of the label and not to be um, distracted by the um, slogan marketing terms. So I've discussed the use of surgical instruments, recycling within our department, and briefly touched on um, sustainability as uh, it applies to the cosmetic and skincare industry. Just to finish, I'd like to thank Dr. Rachel Abbott, a consultant dermatologist here in Cardiff, um, for her mentorship in relation to, to sustainability and dermatology, and for her advice and input in this presentation. And also many thanks again to Eton and Hackham for um, kindly allowing me to use the data used in their previous work in their department. Many thanks. That was splendid, Kate. Well done. And well done to Rachel Abbott for leading our next generation of doctors to um, have interest and engagement in this area. Now, as we wait to join the panel discussion, um, I'm going to just whilst we're waiting for our panel members to join, um, answer a question from Tim Malone, who was asking about increasing use of 
increase in skin cancer, in use, increase in sun creams, and could they be related? Because we have seen increased sun cream use and we are seeing more skin cancer. So he's, in other words, questioning whether the, um, the, skin, the skin creams themselves could be causing skin cancer. I don't think there is evidence for that, but we do know that when people are wearing sun creams, they um, may get a, an inappropriate sense of security. And as we know, sun creams are um, um, uh, not as effective as we think they are, because we tend not to apply them um, in sufficient amounts. I've got a question for Professor Young. Um, Anthony, we've touched on sun creams, and whilst we're on that topic, what about um, non? Um, what about more um, more natural sun creams? You've done a bit of work on that. Yes, there are uh, plants, especially produce. Uh, their own sunscreens because they can't get out of the sun. Um, and we've been working on um, compounds called microsporine like amino acids that are produced by algae. And they work their way up the food chain and are selectively uh, found in, for example, fish eyes, fish roe, octopus eyes, etc. And there's a lot of evidence to suggest that they are natural sunscreens. Um, I won't go into the evidence, but th there is quite a lot. And there's a whole maybe 20 at least 20 of these found naturally with different spectral profiles they're very very photostable and not only are they um, fit sunscreens in the sense of um, absorbing uv they're also antioxidants both from a, and both in terms of being antioxidants themselves but they also activate the antioxidant pathways in, in cells so i think there's a lot of potential for these they are biodegradable um, and that's a problem with the sunscreens that we heard about earlier. They're designed to be stable, so they accumulate. Um, and there's certainly reason to believe they could be harmful. So I had been trying to interest companies in developing these MAAs as potential sunscreens, but that's not an easy job, and it's just a very expensive job to, to get this going. But I, I haven't given up yet. I think they have potential. Thank you very much, Anthony. Um, Elleny, I wonder if I could ask you to um, address this question from Margaret Bassendine. Um, you've spoken about clothing and she's saying, what about cloves impregnated with um, sunscreens, sun creams? And um, that's a great question. And I, I saw there was another question right beneath that one about um, the quality of protection from different fabrics. And so I might answer them together. Thank you. Um, so the answer is there is variability in the protection fabrics offer for some protection and what matters is the thickness of the fabric and the weave, you know, whether it's a loosely woven or tightly woven um, shirt. There's some data that color, darker colors may be more effective. Um, the bottom line is that um, most, most regular clothes that we wear, most regular uh, clothes we wear do do are very effective and there's also if you want to be swimming outdoors or at the beach there's a whole range of uv specific clothing with many brands available that you can that you can choose between so there's no shortage of high quality fabrics but many of the fabrics we wear routinely that aren't you know impregnated or uv labeled are also very effective um, and I just wanted to make a, a specific point as well about the difference between hats. Um, so, so not all hat weaves are equally uh, protective. So again, thick fabrics, broad brimmed hats, making sure the back of the neck and the ears are covered um, are, are much better um, choices for hats. Um, and in addition to other methods like avoiding the midday sun, avoiding midday hours when you're outdoors and exercising or seeking shade. Um, and so I would focus less on the exact contents of the fabric and just emphasize covering up. Elaine, can I add to that with just one, one comment? Um, the, the only thing I'd like to add is that I think a, a lot of these discussions and a lot of the chat comments are talking about individual choice. And um, you know, individual actions really do matter. But one of the things we know is that we really do need like a societal response and a national and international response. And so, you know, we might struggle with, well, which sunscreen is best for coral reef. But one of the things that's important to know is that 
um, the same chemicals that are used in sunscreens are also used to protect lawn furniture and, and like in industrial scale. And so when you look at the scope of the problem of, you know, you using a sunscreen and its effect on coral reef, um, that, that's in many ways sort of like the should you use a plastic straw or, or a reusable straw scope of it. You know, a lot of coral bleaching might, might be related to this, but might also be because of, as you said, ocean acidification and oceanic warming. warming. And so this really does highlight the question of there's, there, there are many actions we can take as an individual, and those are really important. But leveraging organizations like this and medicine and healthcare in general to, to take some of the actions on, on a larger scale is one of the probably longer term and more effective ways to, to really combat the scope of the problem that we're facing. Absolutely. And, and with that, again, to emphasize policy uh, regulations like Hawaii's policy on banning these, the, the sale and distribution of these sunscreens takes away the individual choice that Misha is saying. So, so policy level decisions can have a major impact, um, but policies are driven by individual um, individual behaviors. And so by raising awareness, as people make different choices about the products they buy, the companies adjust. And so the market adjusts and policies are influenced by that. So I, I completely agree with you that we need systemic changes that are not relying solely on the individual level. However, these individual behaviors, I think can make a difference and can have these downstream benefits on influencing the decisions our politicians make. And I don't think we're saying don't use sun creams or sunscreens at all. So I've got a question on that really saying, mm -hmm. what about if I'm using retinoids, you know, can't I be using my sunscreen? So I don't think we're saying that. I think we're just saying, look at other options, look at the more natural options. I nearly said organic, Kate, you see, there you go, dreadful word. Um, so I don't think we're saying that. Anthony, would you like to comment please on the work on, um, skin cancers and the ocean, because I believe you have views on that as well. Um, when you say skin cancers in the ocean, I'm not quite- Sun cream, sorry, oh, sorry, sorry. Yeah. sun cream, sunscreens in the yes, ocean. Yes, yeah, yes, yeah, okay. Yeah. I, I would just like to, to add a comment though. Um, clothing is a better barrier to vitamin D synthesis than sunscreen. So if you're wearing clothing, you're, you're going to reduce your vitamin D synthesis. Uh, you don't need very much UVB for vitamin D synthesis. In terms of sunscreens, I, I, I mean, there are good epidemiological data. These are very difficult studies to do, and they do show that regular sunscreen use does have an effect. But um, the, the best known studies are done by Del Green in Australia. The SPF was about 15 or 16. In practice, the way it would have been used, it's probably something in the region of three or four. People started, the average age of this start of the trial was 50 in Queensland, where they were about a huge amount of sun exposure in any case. But my own feeling based on studies I've done with melanin is that if you want to protect the basal layer um, so that the incidence of skin cancer in, in white skin comes down to about black, you probably need an effective SPF of about 60 because melanin protects the basal layer DNA by a factor of about 60. So we that is a problem. I, 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 you're never going to get to that stage, but I, I, I do think that sunscreens well used um, would be effective, more effective than, than, than has been demonstrated. And Elaine mentioned the fact that they, they're very poorly used. In fact, you see a correlation between sunscreen use and sunburn simply because people see it as a license. They, they, they overestimate their level of protection. Thank you, Anthony. Mark, very quickly, can I ask you, because we're running short of time, can I ask you, there's a question here about uh, raising temperature and biologics. Is it going to have any any impact on biologics? Do you, do you have any views on that? I, so how is global warming and ambient UV likely to affect biological immunotherapies, patients with yeah. systemic dermatological conditions? Is there think, any evidence it'll have any impact? Yeah, I, that's a great question. I'm not mm. aware of any no. um, studies on that. Um, Neither am I. No. Misha, any? any, any Misha? Um, I'm not aware of any studies on that, but no. usually when someone asks a smart, hard question, I try to switch it into a <laughs> question I can answer, which is, you know, I, we're, there, there are more and more agents that we know interact with the sun, you know, from voriconazole as an antifungal to a ton of the new chemotherapeutic agents to, you know, PPIs being moved to over the counter and just being aware of as there's new medications, not just looking at, you know, what we know about them 
in studies, but then as they move out into lar larger society and then looking at environmental impacts on, on those medicines that might be observed outside of the strict clinical trial um, standpoint. Yeah, but I don't think phototoxicity has been reported, nope. correct me if I'm wrong, anybody, but with any of the biologics so far. Um, but obviously they are immunomodulatory and one might, although we haven't had a report of an increase in melanoma or non-melanoma skin cancer or lymphomas, there might be a theoretical concern. So I think we have to watch, but at the moment, no evidence. Another one very quickly, um, any effects on the, uh, on the microbiome? I'm not aware of any work. Anybody any aware of anything on that? I, I think there is some work. Um, I think it probably is discussed in one of the um, suggested reading um, that I gave uh, in the most recent EEAP update. But from, me from memory, this is a, a new area. Uh, there's some evidence that it does affect microbiome, that is the ultraviolet radiation, but I think it's just at the very early stage of research. And Kate, you can't go un unincluded. Uh, quick question here, please, very quick answer on when we use re recyclable stuff. Um, and um, uh, uh, I mean, originally we started using recyclable uh, equipment because of the risk of infection and, and um, um, uh, and the ENT surgery side of things. This is the opposite question, is saying, is there a greater risk when we use re re recyclable uh, um, uh, equipment? There shouldn't be. But can you answer this question about infection? I don't think there's any studies to show that there's any increased risk of infection with using the um, sterilized equipment. I suppose it does come down to the, the process of sterilizing it, but there, there effectively shouldn't be. Excellent. All right, I think we are going to stick to time. And um, I'm sorry we haven't been able to answer all your questions, but thank you very, very much for um, sending them in. Um, I would like to thank enormously, just before we go, actually, we've got COP26 coming up um, in Glasgow. And I'm gonna ask each of our panelists for a short, sharp, quick line on what they'd like to see. Um, Professor Mark Davis. Um, achievable small steps that we can implement to minimize temperature rise. Thank you. Misha Rosenbach. Um, real short-term commitments, not 2050, but 2030. Eleni Linus. Higher ambition and a focus on helping low-income countries. Kate. Um, better regulations in terms of um, the legal requirements surrounding um, matters. And Anthony. Um, I'd like to see action and not PR spin that's typical of politicians. And I'd like to see more education because all change begins with education. My enormous thanks to all our speakers this evening. Um, and especially to those of you, well, not especially, but especially, well, yes, to all of you who've had to fit in with different time zones. Um, the RSM is extremely grateful to you for having, for having contributed. Um, thank you, all your listeners, all you listeners for your interest. Please take a moment to complete your survey. You will be sent a link for the recording, but remember you'll only get your CPD points if you listen to it on demand on Zoom and not if you listen through the RSM YouTube channel. Our next webinar in the series is in two weeks and it's on the um, impact of climate change on cardiac health. A reminder also to listen to Professor Henrietta Bowden-Jones interviewing Claire Gerarda tomorrow night in conversation. And um, to also join Professor Roger Kirby, the president of the Royal Society of Medicine, who will be talking to Professor Anthony Harden on vaccines on Thursday at 12.30 in the COVID-19 series. Now, it's been a difficult year. We've mentioned the COVID pandemic. The RSM needs your help. And I would encourage you all, please, to donate to the RSM by um, plugging onto the website. So uh, all donations gratefully received. And I fi finally, to finish off by once again, thanking all our speakers and wishing you all a very good evening. Good night. Mm -hmm.